Welcome friends to another r slash pro revenge video. Today we've got a crazy story of pro revenge against somebody who was trying to steal from their dying aunt. But first a story from Alberti. HOA rules need to be followed? Sure. The setup. Our tales begin in my teen years about 10 to 11 years ago. It was summer and my parents wanted to go on vacation. Me being a 16 year old idiot with both a gaming addiction and seeing my cue to living the free, independent, unsupervised life, much like a house cat with an open door for two weeks opportunity, offered to house and dog sit while they and my sister went on vacation. Some important background information is probably needed here, since else some idiots here might call my parents neglectful for leaving a 16 year old unsupervised for two weeks. I'm from a way safer and secure place than the US. We lived in the suburb and I was taught most life skills by the time I was 12. The only dangers I could be exposed to would be alcohol poisoning and strains to my wrist from the insane amount of rounds I would force my poor member through during the two weeks. You know, the typical threats for a boy in a country in which 16 year olds can buy beer. The boy and the Karen Megasaurus Rex. Week 1. While gaming took 90% of my time away, and I developed the day and night schedule of a back-end developer, I still did all the chores around the house, with a few exceptions since I deemed they could wait. I check the mailbox and there's a handwritten letter with runes of the ancient. Using my old doctor's notes as a Rosetta Stone, I deciphered that it was from the president of our equivalent of an HOA. Imagine an HOA with a fifth of the power the typical HOA in the US would have. A Hawkeye of the HOA Avengers. If it was a sport, it would only receive participation awards. You get the point. The Moria written tomb said that the grass of my front lawn was too tall according to regulations. I went out, took a look at the grass, which was maybe one centimeter too tall. That's the equivalent of a jelly bean to my freedom measurement, folks. Same day, I cut the grass, cause might as well do so to keep the peace. The day after, a new letter written by the same Shakespeare wannabe came. I grabbed my Indiana Jones hat and performed a heathen ritual in the shed to read the message. The roses in my front yard were going too far out through the fence by 15 centimeters. That's an average sized carrot in Murakana. I once again comply. On the third day of Craftmas, the true cause of annoyance said to me, my backyard's bushes were too tall. Here's where I finally get irritated since you have to enter my parents' property to check the bush's height. With Satan's three commandments in hand, I go and visit my direct neighbor, who I knew were in the HOA board. I ask her about the gutter speak letters and she looks through them and laughs. Those are from the Banshee of Arrakis, aka the Mega Karen, who lived ten houses further down the street. She'd been kicked out of the HOA board after she poisoned three dogs in the neighborhood with rat poison laced treats. Not wanting to deal with her after she threw rocks at me when I was trick or treating as a child, I decided to let the case rest and leave my bushes be untrimmed. The boy, the planted bomb, and the instigation. Fast forward a week into my parents' vacation, after being alone for seven days, I finally mastered the art of playing Mozart's Requiem on the meat flute and decided to do something else. As any teenager would, I started to plan a party, and like the good kid I was, I went around to all my nearby neighbors and warned them about the potential noise, which parties tend to create. At some point here, in my post-flute clarity, I remembered the saying, witches be fading but a good counter-strike match lasts forever. Instead of holding a straight up party, I decided to invite friends over to a LAN party so we could play Counter Strike Source and quickly replace the white blood cells in our body with whatever was in the knockoff energy drinks. Fast forward to said LAN party, my parents dining room smells like teenage farts, axe body spray, sweat and all the chips in the world mixed together. Typical LAN stuff, 1am there's a loud knock on the door. I go out to see two cops looking at me with a surprised Pikachu face. I look at them with the same amount of confusion. Cop 1 says, we have a report that there's a loud party going on and there might be several minors doing drugs here. I say, does energy drinks count as drugs? Cop 2 says, no. I say, then I have no idea what you're talking about. Cop 1 says, we had a frantic woman calling constantly, which is why we came, but it seems we're more of a disturbance than you guys are. At the same time, one of my friends can be heard in the background. OP, get in here, the bomb's been planted and you're the only one alive. Cop 1 says, Counter-Strike? I say, Counter-Strike. They say, we'll leave you to it then. 
Cobb left, and we lost the match. Unrelated though, two days after, I get another knock on my door. There she is, the bane of all good, she who must not be mentioned without carrying Marak's sword and a towel on you. She starts screaming that me and my drug party kept her up all night, and that I'm a horrible brat who needed to tend to my bushes if my parents don't want to lose the house. At this point I stop her and remind her that 1. The HOA doesn't have the power to do that. They hardly have the power to do anything except approve of the house owner's requests. 2. That she was kicked out of the HOA due to the poison incident. 3. That I didn't even have a party. 4. That she needs to stay the freak away from my backyard. She got even madder and started screaming that she would have me and my parents arrested, and that the poison treats were meant for my dog as well. I slammed the door on her faster than hyperspacing from Argos Row. She had royally pissed me off. No one threatens my good boy. No one. Perfect legal pettiness. So now we're at our final act, my revenge. I had about four days before my parents returned, so I made them count. I called the police and visited my real HOA neighbor and got all the necessary approvals. Then I went over and talked with the neighbors surrounding her house. I would do all the yard work which involved loud equipment around her house. Legally, we were allowed to make noise from 8am till 8pm with yard work, but it's considered rude to do it after 5pm. That didn't stop me though. Like a druid on Paragon level 256, I just kept sending leaves and grass flying, as if all the bushes, trees, and odd plants had pissed on my grandfather's ashes. She came out and screamed at me, even threw a rock at me. It brought back old memories, but I didn't care. I was going to make as much legal sound as possible. Whenever she complained, I just told her that her plants weren't up to HOA standard. Friday rolls around, it's 8 a.m., Me and my friends are gathered in front of her house. We have all the tools ready, purchased by the blood coin of my insanity-induced labor the two days prior. It's time to make her pay. We turn on the speaker, the barbecue, and crack up a beer. Speaker is set to the exact legal limit of how loud the music is allowed to be. Most of her neighbors come out and join during the day, since I'd invited them while kill billing their plants. She screamed constantly for an hour called the cops twice, which left after seeing my permits from themselves and the HOA. That's right, witch. If you want a party to complain about, then you shall get the finest party of the Shire just outside of your house. We kept it up to the exact time limit. Although OP's revenge here is really, really good, would you guys agree that this revenge and this agitation that OP's causing them is probably not a good thing? just because it only serves to motivate the neighbor to try to get back at them however they can? Or do you think what OP did was great, and if anything, they should do more of it? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is from Civil Contribution 48 My downstairs neighbor better be ready. Okay, so background info. I, 31-year-old female, live on the ground floor, Europe, and my downstairs neighbor basically lives in the basement of this building. For my entrance, it's the basement, but she, 60-plus, has ground level entry to her apartment. The building's from the 50s, so I realize that at times some noise from the neighbors is expected and generally I don't care about it. For instance, my next door neighbor often has family over in the weekend and I don't care about that. But my downstairs neighbor is so freaking loud when she's out in her atrium. I've lived here for almost three years and sure as heck, every single sunny day she has guests over in her atrium and they're so loud that I can't use my balcony, and sometimes they're even that loud that I can hear them through the closed balcony door from the morning to the late afternoon slash evening. I guess she retired early and I'm on disability working limited hours. She sometimes even invites someone over so they can use her atrium to fix their motorbike, completely ignoring that this is a neighborhood with several multi-story apartment complexes close to each other's amplifying any kind of noise. She also thinks everything happening in the neighborhood is of her business and makes sure to comment loudly on everything going on outside of her atrium. It's right next to the parking lot and common areas. So today I went and did something good for our environment and to get back on her. I brought a bug hotel and bug friendly seeds for my flower box for my balcony so she better be prepared for some visitors this spring slash summer. I suppose it definitely depends on what kind of neighbor you've got, but it might be worth mentioning your concerns to them, 
If anything, at least it'll make you feel better if they're a jerk about it that you get those bees flying around in the area. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Every single video has great stories like our next one from Nabs91, Reverse Petty Revenge, drive through Drama. Yesterday, I was in the drive through at my local McDonald's. The individual in front of me wouldn't move up to the speaker, although there was room. I beeped and motioned for him to move up. He looked up, smiled, and gave me the finger. He made his order and went through. When I went to window one, the employee said that he paid for my order. He pulled through window two and before he left, flipped me off again. I approached window two and the other employee asked if I was with him. I said no, and she said that he had said that I was, and she gave him my order because of that and because he paid. So all in all, this guy was so mad that I beeped at him, he paid for his order and an additional $25 for my order just to mildly inconvenience me. This was a new level of petty I haven't experienced before. I've definitely heard of this kind of petty revenge before, but I think they didn't do it as smoothly as possible. The goal definitely would have been to like make OP understand that they paid it forward or something, so that by the time they pulled up to window 2 and they found out that they took the food with them and left, it would be some kind of like very big like, oh that guy's just a huge jerk kind of moment. Basically the moral of the story here is, if you get up to window 1 and they say that they paid for your order, you tell that person in the window, okay great just make sure they don't hand them my order. Our next story is from beer and food make the weekend was petty over mere pennies. Several years ago, I used to volunteer part-time at a pretty well-known British charity shop. This happened soon after the UK government legislation, where shops had to start charging for single-use plastic bags, like five pence at the time. The idea was to try and cut down on plastic. Most customers were either fine with paying or even started bringing their own bags. But there was this one guy that decided to take the piss. So this guy comes into the shop to browse around for a bit before coming to the till with some form of clothing, can't remember what. I'm scanning his item and he asks for a bag. I tell the guy we have to charge for bags now and that it's 5 pence per bag, something I make sure to tell every customer. The conversation between me and the guy isn't word for word but it's more or less how it went. I say it's 5 pence for a bag, is that okay? I say oh no need, I'll just use one of these. Now, one other thing the charity shop offers is donation bags, little packets that contain a large bag. Basically, if anyone wanted to donate items to the shop, we would give them a few of these packets, and they could either bring back the filled bags themselves, or arrange with the shop for the items to be picked up. After refusing the bag, the guy reaches for a donation bag. I say, oh, those are for donations only. The guy interrupts me, wearing this poop-eating grin as he opens the packet. But why should I have to pay for a bag when these ones are free? I say it's company policy, you have to pay for plastic bags now. The guy says, but these ones are free. The whole situation was starting to piss me off now, and I'd already dealt with some other crappy customers earlier that day, so I stopped caring at this moment and just let them use the donation bag. On the Till's computer screen, we had a add bag button installed that'll add 5 pence to the total bill. Maintaining eye contact, I reached over, said, one sec, then tapped the button and charged him the extra five pence. The guy either didn't care or probably didn't notice, but at the time, that was the most pettiest thing I remember doing. Such a small thing, but it made my crappy shift much better. As long as you're not going to get in trouble for it and get caught over it, I think it's pretty fair to charge that jerk five pence for being as much of a jerk as they were being. Would you guys agree that it's a good thing to have a charge for plastic bags? Let me know what you guys think. Our next story is from Tiefschlag. Try to stop me, Jehovah's Witness. A long time ago, when I was about 13, my parents lived in a big apartment block, at least for our country standards in the 80s, and every summer it was the same. My parents went to work, and I enjoyed the time I had for myself. Insert self-enjoyment joke here. Back then, my very special friends, the Jehovah's Witnesses, used to go from door to door to talk to you about God. Unlike when you see them standing in the street, they would never shut up and take an enormous amount of your time, basically trying to brainwash you in about half an hour. My parents warned me about them ahead of time and told me not to open the door when they came knocking. God alone knows how they got in the building. So during summer break, my usual routine as a bit of an introvert teen was to get up late have breakfast, 
and then either switch on my computer or play the five finger shuffle, and sometimes both. Now imagine how helpful to my agenda a knock on the door and the words, excuse me, do you want to talk about God was while I'm in the middle of another round of spank the monkey? When it happens once, no biggie, just be quiet and wait for them to go away. But when it happens every freaking day, it starts to piss you off, royally. I swear these guys must have a self-enjoyment sensor or something. One day I decided to dodge the issue altogether and try to get out for a change. Why not get some fresh air? Being the smart kid I was, I decided to use the stairs because I was dead sure that my special friends would use the elevator to make their rounds. Oh how wrong I was. Just as I entered the stairwell, along came two guys in their 30s looking exactly like I imagined them. Horn rimmed glasses, short sleeve shirts with ties, classy. Here we go, I thought, trying to avoid any interaction. I wanted to avoid eye contact and squeeze myself past them. Well, I tried. Hello, young man, do you have a minute to talk about God? No, sorry, I'm in a bit of a hurry, excuse me. As I tried to get past, one of them made a big mistake, saying, hey wait, and he grabbed my wrist. Yes, I was an introvert teen, but not only A, I was pissed off, really pissed off, No one messes with my happy time. B. I've been a martial artist since I could walk. Won the regional tournament the year before. Reacting before I could think, I twisted his hand to his back and added a kick to the back of the knee for good measure. Let's just say it did the job it was supposed to do. Far be it from me to say that I felt the sweet joy of payback in that moment. That would be unethical. But the grin on my face spoke volumes. As an added bonus, for some reason they seemed to lose interest in my building soon after. Turned out to be a great summer. Realistically, this is one big lesson about not putting your hands on somebody else. As far as the legality of this situation, I'd say OP was completely in the right because if you're trying to leave and somebody grabs your wrist, a little bit of fairly innocent self-defense I think is more than warranted, whether or not it was a Jehovah's Witness. This next story is from AKSNITD. I'm sorry, what year is it? Here's another story from my work with databases. One of the many data tables that I dealt with was refreshed on a weekly basis. Then when the year ended, we'd freeze the data. That meant we would stop refreshing the data, rename the table from data table to data table 2010 or insert the proper year, and create a new empty table called data table that takes place for the current year. This is because very often, the number of columns would change from year to year, and even the logic would change. So something that was being calculated one way would be calculated differently using the new columns that had been added. There weren't new columns every year, but the logic was always changed. Along comes yet another know-it-all, Harry. Harry's the stereotypical boss who knows little, but is only too happy to take credit. I had been working on the updates for the new year. These updates would usually take around two months since they would come in, be worked on, and it'd be an iterative process. We'd go back and forth on ambiguities, issues with bad data, exceptional cases, and other assorted problems. So for two months, the code was in flux, and everyone knew there may be incorrect values because of this. Harry was having none of this. He wanted everything done tomorrow. Naturally, he was bugging me to get the updates done quickly. None of this two-month nonsense, even though it worked and was a proven system over many years. I ended up working overtime and delivered it in about a month. What did I get for my labor? One lousy thank you email which wasn't even copied to any of the seniors, so my work wasn't even openly acknowledged. And as an added bonus, Harry would be presenting this on call to the people in charge. You can probably guess where this is going. Day of call, Harry pings me and reminds me to have everything ready. Of course, I created this setup. I know it inside out. We get on the call, and Harry's going on and on about how great this table is, blah blah blah. I'm inwardly laughing because, to be honest, the yearly updates weren't that big this time and even then, it's still an improvement of something we've had for a while. It's not something completely new, but clearly Harry's decided this will be his big thing. After all this blabber, he goes to run the report, and what would you know, it's showing last year's information. All the numbers are off because of that. 
Rather flustered, he tries to brush it off, claiming the report needs to be updated with the latest data, and asks me to refresh the process. I run it, and he tries again. No change. Yes, I had made it point to the frozen data of the previous year on the back end. After half a dozen tries with nothing changing, Harry gives up, admits defeat, and closes the call. Needless to say, this blew up in his face and he was reassigned elsewhere. There were a bunch of frantic emails over how to fix this urgent problem. I let everyone stew over it for a week before going in and undoing my changes, which took about five minutes. I still didn't get as much credit as I felt I deserved for delivering the updates early, but I at least got this monkey off my back, and that was enough. If I found myself an OP situation where there was a crappy boss that wanted to take credit for what I did, or at least present it in a way that heavily assumes that they're the one really responsible for this and be like, look at this shiny new tool that I was the driving force for, then yeah, I'd feel the same way as OP and I'd want to expose them too, and I'd want a little credit in myself as well, especially when you work so much overtime on that. Our next story is from Pokey1984, Accidental Revenge on a Wrong Number Caller. I haven't had a cell phone in a number of years. About 2015, I got a shiny new job with a good pay boost, and so I went out and bought a shiny new phone. Naturally, I also got a new number with the phone. All was well with my first ever smartphone. The one before that was a slider, that's how long I'd been without a cell phone. That I've never had a smartphone before is relevant later in my story. Well, it was great for about a month. Then the voicemail started. Phones weren't allowed inside the building where I worked for security reasons, so I checked my messages after work. And every day there was a message on my phone, sometimes two or three. Hi Deborah, this is Jen from hospital. I really need you to come in on Saturday. Please give me a call back. Except, I guess she assumed Deborah had her number because she didn't leave it, and the callback number captured by my phone was just the hospital switchboard. Every day there was a new message. Hi, Debra. The patient in 2B has asked for you. Call me. Hi, Debra. It's Jen. I need you on the third floor on Tuesday. I know that's your day in the East Wing, but we've got a patient coming in who needs so-and-so. Never a last name or a callback number, just friendly, chatty messages. I tried calling the switchboard. They agreed I shouldn't be getting those calls, but couldn't think of a way to track down who Jen or Debra were due to the sheer size of the hospital and not knowing even what department they worked in. After the third or fourth time I called, they promised to pass a memo reminding staff to double check their address books and make sure to leave a name and a callback number with every message. But the voicemails kept coming, and since Jen only ever called while I was in work, I could never catch her to tell her to stop calling me. And she apparently missed the memo about requiring full names and callback numbers on every message. I even changed my outgoing message to say, if you're looking for Deborah, you have a wrong number. This is OP cell. If you have a message for Deborah, hang up. If you have one for me, leave it at the tone. Despite this, the messages continued. So the important part about this being my very first smartphone was that I was trying out all kinds of apps. I even paid a monthly fee to have one that transcribed all my voicemails so I could read them instead of hear them. After a few months of annoying voicemails, I started saving those message transcripts. I collected over 50 of them in a six week period. To this day, I have no idea how Jen didn't know Deborah wasn't getting her messages. They clearly saw each other face to face several times a week at least. One would think that Jen would have asked Deborah why she never returned her calls, or Deborah would be confused when Jen mentioned she'd left a message, but somehow neither of them noticed and I kept getting the calls. Then one day, I had an unexpected afternoon off work during business hours, so I decided to go down to the hospital and track down either Jen or her boss. I just wanted the calls to stop, so I went to the hospital and explained my problem and showed the receptionist my list of transcribed calls. She looked at them for a really long time and eventually gave me back the phone, told me, don't delete those, just wait here a moment, I'll be right back. She gave me back my phone while emphasizing the don't delete those part. I waited. Bored, I started reading the messages on the nearby bulletin board. One was a memo reminding staff and patients alike to always leave a full name and callback number when leaving voicemail messages. So the switchboard made good on their promise at least. It was half covered by a flyer for an upcoming golf tournament, so clearly no one was paying much attention to it, but they tried. The receptionist came back with a gentleman in a suit. 
who was very friendly and apologized for the trouble, but asked to see the messages. So I handed over my phone again. He looked increasingly concerned as he scrolled through them. Then he thanked me for my patience and for bringing this to his attention, and would I mind waiting here for just a little longer? It's very important. See, I hadn't actually read all those voicemails. I developed a habit of seeing the Hi Deborah and automatically hitting save to the file I'd made for them. I just wanted the list of messages to show how very many I was getting, so they'd take me seriously that there was an excessive number. And I guess I hope they could use some of those messages to figure out who the heck Jen was and get her to update her contacts. Five minutes later, me and my list of voicemails were in the hospital administrator's office with four dudes in suits and the receptionist. I told my story the third time and was asked again to show them the messages. Then the room got very quiet. Then the administrator and the four men in suits started whispering. After a few moments, the administrator whispered something to the receptionist who went wide-eyed and answered, right away, in an urgent tone before rushing from the room so fast that she actually lost a shoe and had to back up and put it back on. I swear for a minute I thought I'd stumbled into a medical drama on the TV. That's a serious violation, one suit says in an almost normal voice. We could get sued. Another whispers back a little too loud. I didn't catch most of what they were saying, but caught a few bits about HIPAA and patient privacy. Then I actually started reading the transcripts. Jen had named names, diagnosis, and treatments, and even asked about specific files and included patient ID numbers and such. There weren't a lot of calls with specific info, but there were several in the list of generic, I need you on Tuesday messages. There was some more whispering from the group, And then one of the suits said to the administrator, You can't keep her here after this. The privacy violations alone. And the administrator cut him off with a fierce shake of her head and a stony look on her face. Oh no, I'm firing her right now. I've already sent security to escort her here. Oh, so that's where the receptionist went in such a hurry. About that time, they all seemed to remember that I was in the room. At which point the suits left in a rush, throwing a good bit of legal jargon back and forth at each other. I assume they were all lawyers. Then the administrator sat down and kindly explained to me that what Jen had done was very illegal in addition to being rude. She also very politely asked me if she could copy those messages and implied they might be subpoenaed if I didn't let her and would I be willing to testify in court about these calls if they needed me to. And of course the hospital would pay any relevant costs if I needed to testify and we're very sorry that this happened. We very much appreciate you bringing this to our attention. You've done a great service to all the patients in this hospital. She really laid that part on kind of thick. The tech department walked off with my phone for a bit, and I filled out some paperwork one of the suits brought in with my info and signed a witness statement about the calls they were making copies of, and another agreeing to testify if they needed it, and one saying that I understood testifying was voluntary and I could decline to testify any time by filling out another form, and a form agreeing that I would remove those messages from my phone and not distribute them. The whole visit kind of became a blur, and it wasn't until I was being thanked for my help and escorted out to my car that I really realized what had happened and that this was a big freaking deal. I had just wanted the voicemails to stop, but I ended up getting a department head fired. In the end, I spent less than 45 minutes in the hospital altogether. I never got another voicemail for Deborah, and I was never asked to testify. About three months later, I got a generic form letter in the mail from the hospital legal department apologizing for the data leak and assuring me that no patient information had been disseminated to the public and that the responsible parties had been released from employment by the hospital. Since I'd never been a patient there, I assume my name was just tacked onto the list of parties involved along with all of Jen's patients. No word on what, if anything, happened to Deborah. I'm gonna be willing to bet that Deborah definitely got blackballed from working in that environment. At least they sure as heck aren't going to get a recommendation. I'm wondering what if any legal action might have been done. Guess we'll never really know. And our final story of the day is by Ha 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 Thunk. Greedy grabbers get exactly what they take sweet older lady in our church was a retired nurse, never married, no kids. She had a heart attack and while she was in the hospital, her niece and nephew thought she was dying. They came and took her stuff. 
Her apartment was small, but she had some very nice crystal and silver and some lovely antique furniture. When she came home, she had no dishes and almost no furniture. Niece and nephew denied it, but the neighbors had seen them carting everything away. Several years later, she passed away. Her most recent will, dated after her heart attack, left one dollar to each her niece and nephew. Everything else went to the church. Her estate was nine million dollars. Well, stealing from somebody is definitely a very good way to make sure that you don't end up on their will in the end. That niece and nephew got exactly what they deserved. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.